Welcome back to the Speak the Unspoken podcast. Today, I am joined by a good friend, Heather Kim. And Heather is the co-host of the Abiding Together podcast and runs a very successful women's ministry here in Vancouver, reaching and blessing a lot of the women here in the Archdiocese that we are in, as well as Heather is an evangelist and they do a lot of work, uh, her and her husband, J. Kim, in uh, their ministry, Life Restoration. And so I'm really happy that we can have this chat. I've been looking forward to it all week. Yeah, I wanted to start with, uh, to kind of jump right into it. I know you and I have had conversations about uh, stories, you know, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. I love telling stories. I think I'm a storyteller at heart, and I know you are too. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to uh, our stories, our personal stories, and, you know, in line with the big story, that's Mm kind of where I want to jump into Mm -hmm. today. But um, Heather, why... Why do our stories matter so much, Mm -hmm. especially in a ministry context? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, our stories are absolutely vital, in my opinion. I actually just finished writing a book. Um, It's not, it's going to be out in February. And a lot of the beginning is just exactly about that. Why does the big story matter? The big story of salvation and why is it that we feel often so disconnected from our own story and from the big story of salvation? And for me, in my own journey, I've realized it's been vitally important as I've journeyed into greater self-awareness and wholeness, and I'm still on that journey, but um, yeah, it's been so vitally important for me to reorient myself in those two things and actually come to a deeper awareness of my own story. I think most of us don't understand the impact of our own story, the events, the the positives, the negatives, you know, the good, bad, and ugly that happen that make us who we are. And I think often we go through life and we're responding to different things. We're responding to situations, responding to relationships, and we might have reactions that aren't really what we want. They're not the way that we want to react. We find it's hard to love or be loved, and we might be wondering, why is this going on? And I do believe that under the surface within our story are the answers as to why that is. And if Jesus really is who he says he is, which we believe, and he said, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full, then he doesn't lie. And that's really true. And we really are called to a full life. But most of us end up living in a kind of mediocrity because we're... Our, our way that we want to live and the things that we truly desire are upended by reactions within our hearts, walls that we put up. So I think it's important that we actually grow in self-awareness. St. Teresa of Avila says this is like vitally important that we grow in self-awareness. Um, and I think that within there, that's where we find God. And I actually do believe that our stories mirror, mm-hmm. our individual stories mirror the larger story of salvation and And when we have that orientation of like, I know where I've come from and I know where I'm going, both within my own story, but within the larger context of salvation, I know that I come from a God of love, that I'm made in the image of love, and that means something, and that my destination is heaven. It cha- it's a game changer. It's been a game mm. changer for me and something that I, I think we, we get lulled into a fog, but when we can orient ourselves with that compass, I mean, yeah, it changes everything. There's so many things that what you said that are are like launching off points. I feel like our stories being part of salvation history and the responding versus the reaction. I mean, just this morning, uh, I got a phone call and there was this almost this, you know, this play that because of the the wounding in my story, Mm -hmm. I had this response, the set response. And um, through some healing and stuff like that, I, I could choose... Uh, I, even being aware, I'm like, oh, this is what this person is expecting me to say. So I said it. Yeah. And then I had to like undo it and say, no, 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 this is, that's not true. This is yeah, true. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that's great. And uh, the ability to go from reacting to responding is like having a command on our stories, right? Mm-hmm, and an mm-hmm. understanding. And um, uh, I'm not sure if it's Aquinas or... 
Aristotle, mm-hmm. you know, what, one, one of those two, it might've been um, Plato, but uh, to know thyself, yeah. right? And I yeah. think that that understanding of, and maybe, maybe all of them said it, but the self understanding is one of the most powerful things that we can do in our growth in, uh, in our growth in our relationship with God. And mm-hmm. of course, with each other, which is mm-hmm. what this whole thing is about. Mm-hmm. And then as you were talking about, like my story is part of the big story and how they mirror each other. I just thought, oh man, that's mm-hmm. that's why reading scripture is so important. Oh, oh my gosh. Because I need to understand like, and, and I've had moments where the Lord has said, hey, um, you're like the story in this moment. You know, and that's yeah. one of the ways that he's spoken to me. Mm-hmm. And then I can go and I can sit in that story and go, oh, what was the faithful response in that yeah. in that story? Mm-hmm. Uh, Even from the very beginning, if we go back to the beginning, just as an example, if people are like, what do you mean? You know, like, so if we go back to the very beginning and we look at what's happening with Adam and Eve in the garden, and in the in the beginning it was beautiful. Mm-hmm. God's walking with them in the cool of the day or whatever it says in the garden. And I'm like, that's amazing. You know, like they're just, there's no shame. There's no hiding. There's no nothing. And then all of a sudden the enemy enters into the picture and he starts saying things that cause them to question the heart of God. Like is God, they start to wonder things like, is God holding out on us? Mm-hmm. Like, is there something that he's holding back from us? Like this other tree that maybe we should try like maybe he's not as good as he says he is or as strong as he says he is or strong whatever as he it says, is, maybe you know? maybe i need to figure this out my own way so just pause right there and i go have i ever felt like that of course i have like mm-hmm. I, I have a voice in my mind that comes in sometimes and goes maybe god's holding out on me because i've prayed for this or i wanted this or whatever and it didn't happen or i'm suffering right now and he's not bringing the relief that i think I need or desire. (laughs) And so, yeah, then it, there's questions that arise in my heart, question the heart of God. And what does that inevitably do? It leads me to self-reliance. Well, then I need to figure it out my own way. I need to protect myself. I need to go my own way. And so we see this mirroring that happens. Like there is an enemy in the story. There's an enemy in my personal story and there's an enemy in your personal story for all of us, you know, and that's Mm -hmm. right in scripture that the enemy is there to seek, kill and destroy. Mm -hmm. And, and so to just notice like, how is the enemy come into my story in, in like the, the unique, like way that my story has transpired? What is the enemy whispered to me when I've been wounded, when abuse happened or whatever it might be over the course of the years of my life? And what are the beliefs that I took from that? I mean, that inner working of the heart and coming to an awareness of like my story matters. And to do that, that doesn't mean I'm like focusing on myself and I forget everything else. The goal is union with Jesus. It's not just like healing or being a better person or um, being healthy, like all good things. But the goal really is deep union with Jesus. There's a rupture that has occurred here. So when I look in the scriptures and I see, you know, stories about the harlot and the Israelites, and I mean, that's me. That's me. I'm I'm the one in all those stories. I'm Pilate. Mm. I'm I'm the centurion. Like I am all those people in there. And Jesus wants to bring me into union with him. Right. I feel like every story requires interpretation you know and so when you say look i've i've had things happen to me in my life Mm -hmm. and so us as people we're so wired to we have to have an interpretation Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. and we have to we we say what does this actually mean yeah um whether we want to or not no one just goes oh this is you know this is just what it means even when we look at numbers Mm -hmm. We want them to tell a story, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. we want data to tell us stories. We want, um, accounting ledgers, like, and I I pick these like super random examples because it's like, it's everywhere. This requirement or this need for an interpretation is hardwired into us. Mm -hmm. And as we kind of figure that out, it's, um, then it becomes massive to get the right interpretation of our lives. Because I think what you're saying is like, oh, this happened to me. If if I get the wrong interpretation, oh, you know, God is holding out on me. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not looking after me. Mm -hmm. Then I have to make, then I start to make 
I hardwire other choices to like be the result of that. Yes. And the ultimate thing that happens in bad interpretations is a lack of freedom mm -hmm. in, in my mind. You mm -hmm. know, I think, and uh, what, what is the ultimate lack of freedom? It's being a slave. Mm -hmm. And we can be slaves and be able to walk around, but we are imprisoned within our own story. And I think that yeah. as we kind of read scripture and hang out with people who can help us reinterpret our story and find healing in, um, you know, sometimes it's like in counseling and in um, the miraculous, you know, mm -hmm. where God just mm -hmm. like touches your life and, and mm -hmm. you can, you can, you can see, oh, this, here's a whole bigger story that, that he's opening up. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, the, those are the powerful dynamics that, that ministry is, is really aiming to, to unearth, yeah. you know, and it's not yeah. that we can do it, but yeah. it's, it's that we can, we can participate with it. Yeah. And, and I think to just understand that there are two narratives going on. I mean, there is God and his narrative. And that's what I was saying at the beginning. Like when we come to an awareness of that and we can cling to that and not allow ourselves to like get bogged down by a fog or whatever these other thoughts like that narrative is so beautiful we have a god who is love himself like this is what we all are craving we want so badly and we are made in his image that's why our heart aches for that our heart aches for union and for wholeness because this is the image that we are made in and he has a plan for us of good things and heaven is our goal simultaneously so god is like singing this beautiful song over our life this narrative this story and it's unfolding right now as we're sitting right here and the enemy simultaneously is speaking a narrative over our life and it's almost like a slightly out of tune song because mm. there's some things that sort of are compelling and sound really true when i listen to the voice of the enemy i'm like often like man that feels true Right. That sounds really true. <laughs> and then sometimes I go, that is true. And I make an agreement about it, mm. you know. And the more that we do that, and these are so subtle, these dynamics. I mean, the human person is is amazing, but there are a lot of subtle dynamics going on within our hearts. And not just us. And that's where the ministry piece comes in. This is all of us. This is those who we are ministering to, those we're married to, or that we live with, or that we go to school with, work with. Everybody has a story that's unfolding. And when we're sensitive to that fact and even to the places within our own story that are incredibly broken, mm -hmm. I think it changes the way we minister to people. It has mm -hmm. radically changed my relationship with my husband, just understanding that the compassion and empathy that I can have for him in the day to day has, has increased mm -hmm. significantly because I know his story yeah. and I know that God is healing and redeeming and restoring and vice versa. He knows my story, you know, and so it gives us an opportunity to one, have empathy, but to participate mm -hmm. in the restoration of one another's hearts that as God restores us, we restore other people. You know, there's that quote, Sister Miriam James always says it. It's, I think it's from like the 12 step program or somebody in there. They say uh, wounded people, wound people. Mm. And I'm like, or hurt people, hurt yeah, people. hurt people, yeah. hurt people. And healed people will heal people. Wow. And I really believe that. Like that is, I think, the hope that we can have is that it, as we experience restoration, we're, we're able to speak hope and bring about with God, obviously, and participating with him, restoration and other people. Yeah. I think it's like <clears throat> to understand what a good storyteller God is, is amazing. Yeah. yeah. You know, and uh, as my kind of, my own personal salvation history, my story kind of unfolds. I just see all these foreshadowings of like his call on my life. Mm -hmm. And I go, wow, I would have never have guessed that that would be used here, but it's yeah. almost like you planned it, mm -hmm. you know? And this, this God who is providential and, um, and there's so much power in that. And we see it, we see it in scripture. It is unbelievably phenomenal that, I'll give you a foreshadowing example. In uh, the the hill that Abraham is asked to sacrifice Isaac on gets renamed, and it is the exact same spot where Christ is crucified. Right. Yeah. You know, and yeah. it's like I don't I don't know my biblical timeline, but it's like a thousand years or something like that. Yeah. It's not a short period of time. Mm -hmm. 
But God is like so intentional of saying, hey, Abraham, you don't have to sacrifice your son. Here I am sacrificing my son. Yeah. And here's a ram caught in thorns, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here's my ram, you know, the mm -hmm. lamb of God caught, you know, it's like, wow. Like, yeah, it's mind blowing. It's, it's mind blowing. Yeah. But if he can do that, like he can do so much in, in our own lives, you know, yeah. like, he, yeah. you know, uh, and so just the power of him to be able to tell <clears throat> stories and what's different about his storytelling is that he participates with in the characters, in the story mm -hmm. himself, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. he's not like, Hey, I'm just writing this and like, mm -hmm. distant. Um, yeah. he's not distant and he, you know, he has so many things that he can like grace and all those things that are story influencers and shapers and things like that, that can bring about these. And yet at the same time, I, I get to participate in the story too. Yeah. I get to make these choices. Yeah. And I think the mystery of that is, is <clears throat> beautiful to kind of sit with and, and, um, and almost play with too mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. go, okay, God, like what you're doing in my life now, you're going to do something beautiful with in a decade yeah. or in a couple decades. Mm -hmm. And my story is going to resonate with somebody else's story and heal people, healed people, heal people mm -hmm. and wounded people, wound people. And mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I, I love, I love that God is a storyteller. Yeah, yeah, I do too. And that we get to have our stories intermingle with each other. And if we're in ministry settings that we're invited into these very sacred places of other people's stories. I mean, I can't get over that. You know, in my, I've been in ministry for, I don't know, <laughs> since I was 18 years old. And I still can't get over that when people invite me into the sacred ground of their story. And where we, you know, get to invite Jesus in to restore and redeem. I mean, it it is the most humbling thing. But that we get to, yeah, our stories get to encounter each other. And and God's storytelling is unfolding right now. And that's really the adventure of the Christian life, is that we aren't here on our own having random circumstances just occur and we just have to respond and white knuckle through it till the end. Like God is actively pursuing our hearts and and we, as we as we journey, are hopefully opening up and responding to that and responding to each other. Mm. And, and I mean, there's just something so beautiful about that. But like I said, we often aren't living here in this space that you and I are talking about. Often I'm living in the place where it's like, okay, I got these things to do. I, <laughs> I got, you know, the tasks, I got the problems and all this other stuff. And, and that's what I'm kind of focused on in my day. And that's why I think prayer, recentering throughout the day, having reminders, speaking the truth is so vitally important for us because we will lose our way. Mm -hmm. We will lose our way. So scripture is an anchor. The truth of who Jesus is, is an anchor for me. And I, I, I've been growing in my capacity, but also just in the discipline mm -hmm. of connecting with Jesus throughout the whole day. It's like, Jesus, what do you think of this? Like right. I'm speak the truth here. Um, and even allow, like, I, I love in Glass Canvas, you guys have that, speak the unspoken. I'm like, this is the work of God, really, mm. is for us to speak the unspoken things to him that we wouldn't want to share with anybody else, but that we, we open wide the door to him mm -hmm. and that he's able to go into those unspoken places where we so desperately need him. I mean, that's where we have the felt need of a savior, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, it's like, I don't want to think about that. And most right. people don't want to go there where they actually feel that I am, I cannot do this on my own. And the, and the real felt need there is I need a savior. Mm. And the truth is we have one. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, you, um, Jesus, scripture. And I also think like, I, I sometimes interpret my story wrong, not out of not being in a great place, but mm -hmm. just, I just don't have perspective on myself, yes. you know? And, mm -hmm. uh, and so community and having and investing in people who can go, Hey, I think, I think part of your story is coming out in, in that. And it's like, Oh yeah, and I'm not trying to do that, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not, and I'm potentially not even doing it from a total place of woundedness, 
-hmm. It's just that we weren't designed <clears throat> to live our stories alone. Like we're yes. not the only character, right? Yes. And I think there's a beauty in seeing how saints get clustered mm -hmm. in history, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and are in relationship with each other and things like that. And I think that's <clears throat> love your neighbor um, and love God, love your neighbor. Like those are the things. And I think it's like, that story and this story are, are yeah. they they really they really impact how we get to uh, view ourselves and heal. And I think when you're saying, "Hey, we get caught up in like the day to day," oh man, is that true in my experience in mm -hmm. ministry? In the oh, I want them to learn this thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes as soon as we put like a ministry context on, it's like, okay, well, I understand what ministry looks like and like do this. And we have to almost fight to go, now what is the story that people are um, experiencing here? Mm -hmm. And what, what are the, what are the dynamics that are influencing their story? How are they coming into this, this moment in the sacred space and things like that? Mm -hmm. uh, and so what would you say to, to ministry people are good ways to kind of keep us in the story. And, and we've done some ministry work together. So like, yeah. I think um, in figuring out, okay, where, are, where are men at or where are women at yeah. is really a question of like, what are the dynamics of their story? And then also the idea of like, man, wouldn't it be just great trust building for me not to have the pressure of whatever the ministry hat is that I'm, the pressure that I'm feeling as opposed to just say, Hey, I'm a, I'm a story interpreter, mm -hmm. you know, with others. And it's like, okay, I, ca I can sit here and I can just listen to your story without an agenda mm -hmm. and just understand what's happening in your heart. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think just touching on the community aspect, this is again, the image that we were made in. God is a community of persons, mm -hmm. you know, so we aren't meant to be alone. It's the image that we were made in, even though some of us might think, I do better on my own. I would likely say that's pro there's probably a wound there that you feel like you can't trust other people or something like that because this is the image in which we are made. And there are some things that are true, and that is one of them. You know, it's not just because of how I feel that this is actually true. We are made to be in community. We may not know how to do that. We, may, we might be kind of dysfunctional in how we relate to people. And maybe we've been hurt by community. And, and that community hasn't been for us what God intended it to be and what it should be. Um, but this is what we are made for, to journey together. And I think there's two dynamics that I just want to touch on. One is we need peers that mm. Mm. actually three. So we need peers that we can share with yeah. that we can a few people or even just one that we can lay it all out with and say, this is everything that's going on in my heart um, so that they can come alongside us. We also need someone ahead of us, like a spiritual mm. director or a mentor or a spiritual mother or father who can teach us things. Sometimes that's somebody who might be younger than us, that they can still teach us things. Mm. And that's really important in, I think, just the humility, a disposition of like, I'm willing to sit at your feet and receive from you. Um, and that's something I've really been, yeah, like really trying to cultivate. I want to be able to sit at people's feet. I want to sit at your feet. I want to sit at Jake's feet, all these other people, to just receive the wisdom of a life lived because your story is different than mine. You've learned things that I haven't mm. learned yet and vice versa. Yeah. So we can help each other in that. And then also the ministry aspect where we're called to then be in communion with other people. Mm -hmm. And the goal isn't just to listen to each other's stories, but to bring each other into that communion with Jesus. There is a destination with all of this. When we have disruption, which we experience so much of di division, we're seeing this so much right now. It's so, I mean, I would, let's say every area is just yeah. right in the forefront from politics to church to, you know, our families, myself, like there's division even within COVID myself. COVID oh, yeah, like all yeah, those all those things. Yeah, it's just so hard. That is not 
God's plan. So, so how can we find communion with each other? And I think it, it, at the heart of it is we need to know each other's stories. Like we need to be able to sit with each other and listen to our stories. There's reasons why we might be more sensitive to something than another. And maybe you aren't sensitive to the things I am, but when you heard my story, I sure hope then we're you not can be all more sensitive, sensitive to, to the me. same things. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that would just be so hard. I actually just said I was in counseling with my husband yesterday for us, you know, yeah. And uh, I said, I don't think I can share what I'm going through with Jake right now to the fullness of what I am because right. he's having a hard time and we can't both have a hard time at the same time. You know, like I just can't put it's that like on him. It's disaster. It's like, yeah. Oh, uh, and it's, it's so true of the, the communities that I have. It's like, you know, like kind of money triggers me at different, different points. And like to some people it's, you know, other things. And like, mm-hmm. I'm just sure, I'm so glad that most of the people in my life don't get triggered because when I spiral and it's like the world is ending, you know, yeah, I'm like, yeah. um, uh, they're just like, that's not true. It's a ghost story. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it sounds scary, but mm-hmm. ultimately it's not true. Yeah. And you know, when you wake up in the morning, that ghost story is not going to be as scary as it was at the campfire last mm-hmm. night. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah, I think that's, that's so powerful. And people have those narratives about the church, about God. I mean, those that we minister with, there's a variety of reasons why they have landed where they've landed. And so mm. to just walk in with a black or white kind of thing, like, hey, can you follow these rules? Like, you're not really, like, right. doing what you're supposed to do, like, as mm. a Catholic or as a Christian. Um yeah, it totally misses the person who's right in front of us. This is the sensitivity that we should have with one another to go, they they have a unique story. There are reasons why they are doing what they're doing. And I remember my husband, Jake, was working at a parish um, years ago doing adult faith formation in RCIA. And he said, all of these people would come to me and it would start with, I have an issue with the theology of Mary or I have an issue with the theology right. of the Eucharist. But really, as they talked more, Mm. there was a wound underneath the surface. And it had less to do with the theology than it did about, I've been impacted by God Mm -hmm. through the the false narrative that I believe about who he is. And it's shattered, you know, the real person of Jesus. And I now believe this false image of who God is. And that's affecting my ability to grow in relationship with him and with his body, the church. Right. So, so usually there's things wrapped up in our own stories that have a lot to do with how we engage with the church or don't engage, yeah. how we engage with community, don't engage and God too. Yeah. And the culture we live in, yes, there's a massive counter narrative going on right now, right? Mm-hmm. And some of the some of the story points are, you get to define your own happiness. You mm-hmm. know, like mm-hmm. there is no transcendent order. Uh, science has all the answers to how to be happy, or mm-hmm. you know, truth is this. And uh, and I, I think the misstep would be, oh, those are false stories. We don't have to deal with them. Yes. I actually think it's like, oh, we have better stories. Mm-hmm. We just have to tell them. Mm-hmm. And I think for whatever reason, uh, the, 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 the great, we need better great storytellers in the church, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and I'm not saying we need videos and articles <clears throat> and content, you know? Yes. I think we need people who can expound narrative, right? Yeah. And who show that with their lives of like, oh, I'm actually like, I'm not following the story lines that culture is is pointing us to. Mm-hmm. I'm actually, you know, I think there's a different story. I don't think that's what reality looks like. And the witness of that in people's lives is pretty profound. And when you when mm-hmm. they see the the peace and the the you know you said you quoted John 10 earlier, like the thief comes to seek, kill and destroy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, but I have come so that you may have life and have it to the full. Mm -hmm, And when we mm -hmm. live that life to the full, because we're living in accordance to the story, that's the truest, Mm -hmm. the most true and absolutely true. That's when we get to go, Oh, my life will resonate with people Mm -hmm. because that's how we're made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that, confidence in in this kind of story that we're talking about yeah i've just seen it over and over it's the game changer in ministry contexts not i'm not afraid of other people's stories either yeah and i think that there's um 
Um, and yeah. I think be, you're not afraid, probably, because you've experienced some redemption in your own story. Mm. And, and I think that that's very true for me. I was afraid to go into my own story because I hadn't yet experienced in a personal way that God is a healer and a restorer and a miracle worker. And once I did, and I mean, I've been Catholic my whole life. I studied theology and catechetics at Franciscan University. I've been in ministry since I was 18. I don't say that yay for me, but I I just mean, I've been pretty engaged in the church, but why did I not believe that? I sort of just believed, hey, we all suffer. You got to suck it up and... Right. Do your best to get to heaven, you know. Right. But like these narratives were like tapes playing in my mind that I was battling insecurities and beliefs about myself, beliefs about God, beliefs about my belonging, my place, and all of that. And when I experienced like, oh my goodness, like I don't have to wait until heaven to experience some of what God has to offer, this full life that he's offering. Like I am experiencing that now. Like I'm willing to walk the path with Jesus to the cross mm-hmm. and come out on the other side in this you know the power of his resurrection well when you've experienced that yeah you're not afraid then the next time that you feel god leading you into a place in your own story and and into other people's stories because you're like i can hear your story because i know jesus isn't afraid of those stories and i'm gonna walk him into your story i'm not going in there alone because i can't do anything about it but he can yeah and and there's such a big difference between small stories and big stories right oh yeah and it's like I think I even get sucked into small stories of like oh. what's happening in 2021 and like how are we going to blah, we blah, blah. Um, yeah. And then like kind of coming out of the small story and like, hey, you know, I've tasted the big story. And people go, oh, Christianity is an adventure. Like I didn't experience that until like adventures have uh, protagonists mm-hmm. and antagonists. Mm-hmm. Adventures have danger. Yeah. Adventures have require risk. Yeah. And the difference between small stories and big stories are the degrees to which you feel comfortable risking because you feel secure in the guide to your story the, or the the narrator but also the the author mm-hmm. of of the story, mm-hmm. right? And and to some degree that there's that metaphor breaks down in like authors and narrators and stuff like that. It's like the person, uh, the the father who loves us mm-hmm. is the one who's saying, I've created you, I've made you, like I have a plan for you. Mm-hmm. And and I feel like it's hard to, to trust God <clears throat> the first time, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. I, I remember points in my story where I had to go, uh, you know, like when I transitioned out of, grew up Catholic, kind of had... Um, you know, my story is left, left the church, um, found faith in the evangelical space. And six months later, I was back in the church, like kind of a weird one, mm-hmm. like a weird mm-hmm. revert convert kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but I remember after the, that point going, oh man, here's a, here's a tough spot in my story. And God, you're asking me to trust you, but I don't actually have a history of doing that. Yeah. So the first time you got to mm-hmm. do it and the faith in that. And then the next time it's still hard but it's like this little bit easier and a little bit easier, a little bit easier yep. until you develop that. Oh yeah. The story, it always works out. Yeah. Oftentimes it works out in an unpredictable way to myself. Yeah. Uh, and I off, I often hang on to like, Oh, you need to write this line in the story. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, or you're not coming through for me. Mm hmm. Uh, but oftentimes it's like, no, no, he's going to fulfill if I can trust in the desire that I have and not in how I want that desire to be met. Yeah. That's when I can actually step back and go, you can fulfill my desire in whatever way you know to be the best thing for me. Mm -hmm. And I can surrender to that versus you need to provide this thing for me at this point or you're not good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You Mm -hmm. know, it's just a... Yeah, and I think a lot of what you're saying is like we have emotions and that's a beautiful thing as a human person they're not bad but they can often lead us into places that we don't even know how fast we're going to get there like that spiral you know that Mm. you were talking about they can take over and become the one that's driving the bus instead of you know 
truth that's driving the bus. So I think it's important to understand the role of emotions and what happens. I feel like in our culture, emotions are driving the bus right now for a lot of people. It's not necessarily truth. It's not goodness. It's not beauty. It's our emotions. It's rage culture. It's this, it's, you know, there's all of these things going on. And then that becomes the narrative, whatever, wherever our emotions lead us. And I'm like, no, there are some things, there is objective truth. And the more that we understand that and that, that truth is who God is. Like, it's not just, he's about it. He is truth. He is the truth. Then that will anchor us in how to then approach society and approach the culture. And how do we navigate that? Because just because I feel a certain way, even if it's compassion and brokenness Mm. for someone, like I just feel like the, oh, I'm so heartbroken for you that you're suffering in this. Mm Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that I then have to change what I believe right? to, to come and meet that person where they are. Sometimes, yeah, there is suffering. A lot of times, there's a lot of suffering on this side of heaven. And God isn't the source of that. We were talking about this earlier, that he is a God of life, not a God of death. Mm-hmm. But this is the story that we find ourselves in. It's right in scripture that there will be pain and suffering and death and And that, but this is not what we were made for, you know? So we are going to have to deal with it. And I know a lot of people struggle with that. We're like, why, why won't God answer my prayers? I'm like, that's heaven that you're longing for there. Yeah. That is the the echo of heaven in your heart that you want that wholeness where there's no more tears anymore, but that's not where we are. So having truth as the guiding force, that objective truth and what's held in scripture that doesn't change. This is forever. And even though, it might disrupt people, which is like the big faux pas of the culture today. Don't offend anybody. Don't disrupt anybody. Um, that doesn't mean that the truth has to change. And, and and I think there has been a real shift. Like as, you know, the Christian culture has diminished and this, <clears throat> this secular culture has risen. It's like the truth of scripture and God is declining and my opinions and right. my feelings are what is the most important thing. And, and I think that's getting us into a lot of dangerous places. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's Viktor Frankl that said, emotions make wonderful servants and terrible masters. Yeah, yeah, you know? that's very and, true. And, uh, and, and in our culture, I feel like there's this tension of like life, you know, like life is pretty, creates a lot of tension, especially as we go through a pandemic, which like has disrupted the whole world, right? Mm-hmm. It hasn't been business as usual, yeah. you know? Um, and I think that when we don't have a compelling, uh, thing to match that tension, you know, on the yeah. other side, mm-hmm. like the temptation is to drop that and say, okay, well, therefore my <clears throat> belief system has to accommodate that. Yes. And if, if I don't have, uh, if I'm not grounded in what the real stories are, you know, scripture says, like you were saying in this world, we will have trouble. Mm hmm but take heart, I have overcome the world. Yeah, you know? that's and, one of my favorites. But, but it's like, oh, we don't, like I struggle to live that because I'm expecting like, oh, things are going, you know, kind of bad at times. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a few, like we suffer in, in our own lives, in our culture, like um, there's bad news, uh, but there's also the power of, of being right in the darkness as light. Yeah. You know, and light overcomes darkness you know and i know we're but i think on one side of that a lot of people are like so disrupted rightly so i get it fearful of the culture that they want to get out they're Mm. like Mm. i felt this so many times like can we just find an island all our friends can live there and we can just like go down the hatches yeah all of that and i'm like but that is not the call. Like we are made for mission. This is, this is God's call in our life. This is the whole point of the church's existence is that we would evangelize, you know, to the nations. And so we cannot remove ourselves from the culture. So how do you stay immersed in the culture in relationship with people who are, have a completely different worldview, who are atheists, who are homosexuals, who are all of this stuff that may not line up with, you know, your belief system. And how do you stay there? 
and love each other, yeah. like really love each other and continue to do life together. Yeah. How do those things coexist? It's very hard in the culture because even the culture is saying you can't, you know, you're this camp or this camp, this team or this team right. and we don't mix. And I'm like, this is so wrong mm -hmm. because we are made for communion. So whenever there's division, we know the enemy is wildly at work in that Yeah, because this is not how we were meant to be. Yeah. We're meant to lay our lives down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think that some of that laying our life down requires a confidence that even if I get hurt, it's going to be okay. Yeah. You know, and as Christians, like we're the ones that are supposed to do the first step towards yeah. that. And I think that, and then all the stories kind of, kind of get in there and it gets messy and stories are messy. You know, like I don't want to, so they're messy. not clean and they don't resolve as nicely as a, you know, they're like Christopher Nolan movies. Mm -hmm. Like even the end, you're like, I'm not quite sure. Like, did it topple <laughs> like, over or I not? I need closure. You know? <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, and, and I think that, as you say that, I think these felt needs in a ministry context like become mm -hmm. so important because the felt need is in that relationship space. It's in that story space. And mm -hmm. I think it's okay to, to start with story first and felt need first. Yeah. And my when i started youth ministry like you know a year after my conversion which was you know i i wasn't fully formed that's for sure mm -hmm. uh i just felt this pressure to go like you got to believe you know like you know the these kids needed to believe first yeah, yeah um and i i wish that everyone in ministry could just have the freedom to go hey I, we can meet felt needs that's what yeah. the church has always done that's what mother yeah. Teresa did yeah and you know, and and yeah what do you think of the whole felt need yeah first dynamic yeah i mean i don't want to give the impression i'm like saying something bad about pastors but there's been many times that i've been sitting at mass and the priest for his homily is focusing on an aspect of liturgy or you know how the translation might be this or that or they're giving a historical context for the biblical narrative or whatever it might be and i'm like those aren't bad things. Mm. At the same time, sitting in these pews are people whose marriages are falling apart. They're more depressed and anxious than ever. They don't know if they believe in God. Their hearts are completely broken. They're in financial crisis, whatever it might be. Like there, there are stories sitting here who desperately need the gospel. They need to know that Jesus is there for them and that the community is there for them and so there's a part of me that i'm just inside i'm like who cares like that's what i want to say like who cares you know and, right. and again like i said it's not that those things aren't important yeah but that isn't it doesn't have the awareness and, and the sensitivity to the stories and the felt need of who you're talking to there's a time and a place for everything I think for most people, they have so many felt needs that mm -hmm. it's like, it's overwhelming. You can't go there, you know, with all of this other stuff until yeah. you get into the story and you start journeying. And so we don't want to stay with the felt need. We want to be moving people in a direction because there are destinations, you yeah. know. Um, but how we do that, we need to be very, very careful, sensitive to the person, sensitive mm -hmm. to the story. You know, it's not about me. Uh, even using them so that I can like get them into the church. It's like, no, I'm just here with you. I right. want to journey alongside of you. And I want to keep kind of pointing the way to where life is to be found. Not because I believe this is my belief system and it's right, right. but because though this is where life is found. This is how your life gets better. Yeah. And, and I think we're way more as ministry people, we're less about getting people into the right theological system not that we don't, you know, believe in uh, right theology, mm -hmm. but it's way more about helping people encounter love. Yeah. And he, you know, God is love, right? And the theology makes sense then. Everything makes sense after that yes. point. And, and I think the gospel really moves. And we've seen this throughout salvation history. When the church and the people of God are meeting the needs of the people. Yeah. This is why the corporal works of mercy and like you know this is why we build hospitals this is mm -hmm. what 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 helped rome was the the women and the children and the slaves that their needs weren't being met because of the power dynamics in rome mm -hmm. when their needs were met by the church and said look we're all slave and free jew and gentile mm 
mm-hmm. uh, man and woman, we are all the same in Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. That message resonates. And when those people go and say, look, I'm going to be with you. Um, I'm going to care for your sick. I'm going to, if you, you, people got rejected in the plague in Rome and it was the Christians who took after them and they became new family. Mm-hmm. And it like, that's what spreads like wildfire yeah. and helps people go. Yeah. Theology helps me understand more of God when I'm at that place. Yeah. But somebody coming to me and saying, <clears throat> Hey, can I babysit your kids or mm-hmm. can I, uh, so you guys can get away or get a date or something, you know, like that's the stuff that we're, where I encounter God when somebody loves me through, through those things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And theology is super important. Yeah, you know, like you and is. I are not, it is. not downplaying it. We've had great theology. It is. And we and we should know the reason yeah. for our hope in Jesus. We should. Mm-hmm. Like it's not it can't be only stories. You know, like it is rooted, like I said, in truth, and the theology is the truth. So it's mm-hmm. good to know those things. It's good to pursue knowledge. I think it informs like our experience. It helps make sense of some of the things that that we go through. But look at Jesus. He was the master of it. He was the master of recognizing the felt need, no matter what was going on around him. And if we put ourselves in some of those biblical stories, I mean, it is amazing what he did, because I don't think I would do that. Like, if you take the story of the widow at Nain, Mm -hmm. it's like this little story that we hear sometimes at Mass, but I was like, I didn't really hear it until one day I did. And I was like, Jesus comes into the scene, and if you picture it, it's like a crowd of people are already following him in. So he's got people all around him. If that was you or me and we're the ones they're focusing on, we'd be feeling pretty good about <laughs> ourselves, you know, for one. But you're trying to manage all those dynamics and like be humble and like all the things. Right. And then you walk into the city. He walks into the city and there's another crowd of people because there's this huge funeral going on. Mm. And and what does Jesus do? Like instead of like, mm, I'm going to use this opportunity to teach you the truth, mm. he notices the widow mm. who has just lost her son who is having this funeral and he goes right to her and says don't cry mm. <laughs> i'm like and then he heals the son like raises him from the dead i'm like if that isn't going to meet the felt need i mean i don't know what <laughs> is i mean he's the master of it uh, um but i love that even that he just encounters her first and and is sensitive to her tears is sensitive to her experience like she's just lost her son but she also lost her husband she has nothing left right. he's not aware of the crowds right. he sees her and yeah. I'm like, that's what I want. Like, if I'm in a ministry setting, I don't want to be seeing the crowds. I don't want to care about the stage or people wanting to talk to me. Like, I want to see the person mm-hmm. who who needs to encounter Jesus. That's what that's what I long for uh, to be that kind of person. And this, like, what you're saying is like this belong, believe, you know, mm-hmm. behave dynamic, right? Where behavior is like, uh, you know, living. Um, and it's just so easy to look at behavior and say, let's start there and let's fix your behavior, right? And But this belonging thing is, it's absolutely who Jesus is. I think of Zacchaeus and like, he's just like, hey, I'm going to come eat with you tonight in your home. Yeah. Um, man, that that was probably a felt need. Like yeah. mm-hmm. outside of, uh, um, he's, he's not fully Jewish, he's not fully Roman, you know, like he's kind of stuck in these two things. Mm-hmm. Um, and God's like, I choose you. I, cho- I choose you, let's yeah. go hang out and... Uh, and then he just like encounters more and more Jesus. And then he, you know, then the behavior shifts. And I yep. think the woman at the well too, it's like, man, it's lonely at the well in the middle of the day when it's super hot and mm-hmm. it's uncomfortable because I got to go when other people don't go because of my felt need is shame avoidance. Mm-hmm. So when he shows up there and asks of her something that restores her dignity mm-hmm. and you know for jesus to reveal himself to her as the messiah in that moment Mm -hmm. is just powerful belong you know belief and then behavior she goes and tells Mm -hmm. everyone and now you know and i think yeah if 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 as ministers you know people who want to help other people encounter the the jesus that we've encountered if we can um i just pray that we can find uh and live by those dynamics where it's story first um belonging first felt needs first uh i think that those are the things that give me so much hope Mm -hmm. in a world uh i i my faith is that 
those things radically transform a ministry landscape in any context yeah when we yeah. focus on those things first yeah i agree so, so. i agree so good so good heather it has been great chatting with you, you as too. always Me too. um so we're gonna wrap it up there but uh yeah looking forward to to more yeah me too hey everyone thanks for listening i hope you enjoyed that episode as much as i did heather is great and you can see more of her work at the abiding together podcast as well as life restoration.ca and if you enjoyed the show consider subscribing at anywhere you find your podcast on the speak the unspoken podcast you can also see more about us here at glass canvas at glasscanvas.io. thanks for listening and we'll see you again next time